Okay, and you can hear me clear, right? Yep. Perfect. Okay, so this is, uh, I don't know what, uh, what is this? One, two, three. This is the fourth uh, presentation in a, a series of five, and it's uh, uh, about me going down a rabbit hole. And uh, as always, let me start off by saying I'm not an expert in this. This is just what I kind of found out going along along the way and it could be right it could be wrong but just don't hold me to it and uh, it all started from me looking at the buck converter and uh, not being able to make it work in LT spice and then I started looking at LT spice to why this buck and stupid buck converter couldn't work and it led me down a whole bunch of rabbit holes where we talked about inductors MOSFETs and finally by me talking about MOSFETs, I started looking at a, a build, a transceiver Peter and I were working on, I called the Dueling 612, the D612, and uh, the power amp there wasn't working very good, so I took a start to take a look at that. So that's what the conclusion of this presentation is about uh, power amps. So today, um, we're gonna talk about uh, FFTs, um, how to do an FFT, in uh, LT Spice, and let me get down. Where am I here? I I know I could put this into presentation mode, but I find this easier, especially since I got a, you know, sometimes I'll be jumping um, around uh, from slide to slide. This way I could see my thumbnails. And I, I think it's big enough everyone can see it. So this presentation is about uh, uh, FFTs and uh, uh, LT Spice, but more, there's a little bit of background about FFTs, and uh, by the end of this, your brain is going to hurt. So just, again, about the buck, in a, at the buck converter. I looked at the buck converter. I couldn't get it to work. Here was a design I ran across. I couldn't get it to work, and I went down the rabbit hole of trying to understand how a inductor works and why doesn't a MOSFET work, and what that eventually led me to was this thing called a high, high side bootstrap circuit. And that's necessary to turn on a, um, a MOSFET in a high side switch, which is what we've got here. And once I figured that out, it the current and voltage came out exactly what was predicted here. So uh, everyone was happy. But, you know, to get that to happen, I had to look at MOSFETs and how they work and why, you know, the MOSFET wasn't working properly. and. Uh, that rabbit hole led me to understand that there's a lot of capacitance involved in these MOSFETs. And I create a little model of a MOSFET here based on the capacitances just to measure the input impedance. So here's an LT SPICE model for IRF 510. I created this based on parameters here for the IRF 510 and they match exactly. And as you can see at high frequencies, these MOSFETs basically short out. So uh, with that in mind, I, um, I started looking at uh, uh, my Dueling 612 because I thought, okay, well, maybe that MOSFET I've got is horrible. Maybe I should get another MOSFET. So in the last presentation, I started looking at the other amplifiers and looking at other MOSFETs. And uh, there was a mistake made uh, in that presentation and had to do with the use of log versus log 10. And I found out that in LT Spice, log refers to the natural logarithm. It's, it's a log E, log base E. So it's based on E to the X, and you need to use log 10. So in my um, measurements, I used the natural logarithm. And so all my measurements were off by a factor of 2.3. It's a math thing. Just don't question it. It's off by 2.3. And uh, so uh, in the last episode, in the last uh, presentation I, I did, you know, I, I talked about my Dueling 612 power amp, and uh, I took a look at that. And one of the problems was it wasn't legal. So, you know, according to Canadian regulations, you're for a five watt emission, like you have to be about 43.5, 10 watts is 44, 
uh, DBC. I call it DBC. It's DB carrier. That's the emission from the carrier. It's actually fundamental. So whenever I say DBC, I mean fundamental. I don't mean carrier. Carriers applicable for like a um, CW where you're putting out a carrier, but in sideband where the carrier suppress, there is no such thing as a carrier. It's the fundamental frequency. So uh, my bad, I'm going to use DBC and I don't care what anyone says. It's just, I'm using that. So it's got to be 40, uh, 44 dB below the fundamental. And I was getting about 40 dB and uh, which meant the, D, the D612, the amp was garbage. It wasn't good. So there's a bug in it. And so here's the measurements I made of the various amps. Here was the original 612. By the way, all these measurements are in LT Spice. Everything I do here is in LT Spice. There are no measurements whatsoever outside of LT Spice. And uh, so that was my original power amp. It had about an 8 dB roll off. And here's the other power amps I took a look at. And these, I fixed the log 10 issue. And also too, what was missing was conduction angle. Um, that was missing out of the measurements here, so I had to adjust that. And so these are the accurate uh, roll-offs there. But I'll explain that more in my next presentation when we start looking at uh, measurements. I'll talk about conduction angles. So um, what I decided to do was to take each of those power amps and I would swap in various MOSFETs and I would look at what the performance was in LT Spice. And basically what I said I would measure was, you know, uh, these parameters here, just to see how well it was performing. And basically there was only three things I had to measure. I had said at the time I had to measure, which was the purity to ensure the spectral purity, to ensure uh, Industry Canada compliance, the output power, and how much power is being dissipated by the MOSFET. But what I needed to also measure, and there's a bug in me saying this, uh, you know, I had to also measure conduction angle. So when I get into my presentation on measurements, I'll talk about that. So today, what I want to do, that was just a sort of a uh, background of where we were or how we got here. So this evening, what I want to do is I want to give a little bit of background about uh, uh, the Fourier transform, talk about a uh, little bit about what a continuous transform, discrete and fast Fourier transform is, then talk about some important parameters for FFT, which becomes very important when you look at doing an LT SPICE FFT or even doing an FFT in your scope. Now, in the case of a spectrum analyzer, that's all done for you in the background and you know you could just turn this off. If you're just using a spectrum analyzer, all this stuff is done for you in the background and you never need to know anything here but a discrete and continuous. But uh, I'll advise you right now, some of your brains are gonna hurt by the end of this conversation. And you may not get it uh, depending on your um, understanding of math and integrals and summations and that kind of stuff. But that's okay, you don't need to get the math. I'm gonna try and explain it without using math and hopefully you gain a high level understanding. So what's a what's the Fourier uh, transform? So let's start with the Fourier expansion. So this dude way back when, by the name of Fourier, don't ask me what his first name is. He came up with this and he said, okay, any continuous function, and a continuous function is like a equation. So it's a blackboard equation. You're gonna write the equation out on the blackboard and you've got an equation which describes one of these things. So you've got some equation called F of T. It's just an equation, okay? He said that continuous function, that equation, that function can be broken down into these terms, a sum of cosine terms and a sum of sine terms. And each term has a coefficient in front. So here you see the A1 term applies to just T, F of T, the same T, Here's 2t, the uh, a sub 2, which is the coefficient for that term. So you can think of these cosine and sine terms at different frequencies. They're kind of like different frequencies. And you could think of these coefficients as volume control knobs. 
So if you think of those mixers, you see that, you know, in a recording studio, they got all those knobs, they tweak. So that's what you're doing here is that you're tweaking all these coefficients and saying this term has more content than this term and you're just tweaking it. So that's, that's the Fourier um, expansion. So with a little bit of math, you know, that's how you write the Fourier expansion. Okay, and so you can arrive at these Fourier coefficients. These are the, these coefficients here. You can solve that equation and you can get these, these, equa these um, terms here. And um, so, for example, uh, for a square wave, let's look at a square wave. So we've got a three volt square wave here. Uh, it's got a DC offset. Remember Michael's conversation last week where we talked about a DC offset. So in case, this case, the DC offset is 1.5 volts. There's a DC offset of 1.5 volts to bring this up, right? So if we look at this, um, these uh, coefficients here, what we'll find is that the cosine terms disappear. The cosine terms integrate to zero. It's a math thing. Don't worry about it. Just the A terms are zero and only the B terms are valid. So if you look at this, your, your terms works out like, like this. So the DC term, which is this first term here, this first term is your DC component. There is no... Um, sinusoidal component to that. That's just a fixed number. So that's called your DC term. So in this case, it's your uh, A naught, uh, the amplitude divided by two. If you work this out for B, uh, for A sub zero, well, here, here's A zero. You you do this this math and it comes out to, to the amplitude by, by two. So the amplitude is three divided by two, 1.5, and lo and behold, it works. And so for the terms, uh, for the even terms, if you solve this, they become zero and only the odd terms comes out and it's uh, two times the amplitude divided by N. And remember way back when, uh, there's a comment Hassan made way back when saying, oh, the coefficients drop as a function of one over N. So that there, there's the proof of that. So for a three volt peak to peak sine wave, here's the volume knobs for the B terms. B0, 1.5, B1, 1.9, B3 is 0.63, B5, 0.38, etc. So if you take these terms, plug it into that Fourier expansion, right, you get a square wave coming out. Right, so now, if you look at this, we are multiplying the function by a sine or the function by a cosine. We're doing a multiplication here, and we're doing this fancy thing called the integral. So basically what that's doing, that's a correlation. It's called a correlation. You're looking to see if this sine term has a high correlation of being into that function. Is this function part of it? Are they correlated together? A high correlation means that a lot of this function is in that function. So here's an example. So Here's the f at x term, and here's the sine x term. So in this case, the f at x term is exactly the same as the sine x term, so the correlation here is high. There's a high correlation because sine x is, in fact, part of that fx. So now, if this is the sine x term here, here we got two bumps, three bumps, and we got one bump and, you know, a bump and a bit. You look at this. Well, there's not much of this. The correlation here is low, right? And in this case, here's the same signal, f at x, same signal. And here's this term here. And so in this case, the correlation is also low. There's not much of this in there. So basically, all you're doing here is a correlation. Now, the reason that you've got sines and cosines here, this is important, is that because... If you look at a sine wave and you look at a cosine wave, the sine wave starts at zero and the cosine starts at one, right? If, if you're looking at it um, uh, on a unit circle, you're just looking at a value of one, right? There's no, uh, there's, there's no um, uh, large amplitude. There's a, there's a phase shift. 
So you could say the, the sine is a 90 degree fascia from the cosine or, or, or vice versa. So if you take these two waves and you combine them, okay, you'll see the resultant wave. There's a phase shift here compared to this function from this uh, waveform here. It shifted. So it's as if this waveform is shifted this way. It shifted to the left. And this waveform here is at the top. You could see it's as if this has been shifted this way. So by using sine and cosines, you could get the phase out of this as well, too. Coming out of the math, you can get the phase of your signal. Okay, so the Fourier transform basically is the are, are these coefficients. So, and they're telling you how much of a specific frequency is involved. So it's telling you, for example, how much of one megahertz is in that signal, or how much of 13 megahertz is in your signal. That you're, that you're measuring. So in this case, here we've got one frequency, you know, single waveform. So we've got one coefficient. Theoretically, we've got one coefficient, a pure wave. There's one value here. And this is in the uh, frequency domain. So this we're plotting the intensity and versus frequency. So N turns out to be your frequency, right? So this is kind of like N n equals 5, for example, right? So this might be n equals 1, for example, and n1 might correspond to 3 megahertz or something, right? So here we've got a single, it's a single frequency, we've got one peak. So in this case, we've got two frequencies, and so we get two peaks, we have two coefficients, okay? Now, typically, this analysis is done in like, F, FPGAs or high-speed processors, and they're extremely fast and they can do it really fast. But to do this kind of analysis in a computer, it takes a while. It takes a lot of computing power. So as an example, back in 2017, I built this uh, ready PSK transceiver that I took down to uh, FDIM, as a matter of fact. And this came out of a conversation I had with Paul Paul Darlington a year or two before at uh, FDIM. And uh, we were talking about these modules he had. He had these sudden RX TX modules, which had a footprint for a Arduino to plug into them. And they were basically a 40 meter uh, transceiver that you could control with a Arduino. And so I was talking to him and he said, there's no way a 16 megahertz 16-bit Arduino could decode Ridian PSK. And I love a challenge. So I took it upon myself to go figure it out. So I, I took out of these, out of the RX modules, I took, uh, I sampled the audio coming out at 9,600 hertz, 10-bit samples, and I used two tones, 830 and 1,000 hertz. So I tweaked the pass fan. So I'd get those frequency for mark and space and I use correlation, not an FFT, to detect the 830 and uh, uh, 1000 hertz signals. Here you could see the blue is the 1000 uh, hertz signal, one kilohertz, and the orange is the 830 hertz signal. So, and here's a demonstration of that. So what I actually did, I didn't use correlation, I used something called autocorrelation, okay? So in this, spreadsheet, this was what I used to design my algorithm. So let's take a S9 830 hertz signal. And let's do the correlation here. And so this is the output of the correlation. You see we get a nice peak here at about 11. And so that corresponds to 830 hertz. So if I run this in my microprocessor, in my little Arduino, I run this autocorrelation and I found a peak here, which is really strong, you know, it's 400,000 counts, then I know I've got a, a mark or a space. Now, if I go down to a really weak uh, signal, S4, and I do the same thing with an S4, and if you see here, the counts about 300 counts, 
So here now the count's down around eight. So in reality, this would be buried in noise. You'd have a noise floor. So we, it, this is a theoretical exercise. You wouldn't be able to detect this, but the algorithm was able to detect the peak at 11. So in the same thing, we could do the same thing for, uh, you know, an uh, S4, one kilohertz signal. And now the peak shifts over to about nine, right? So I knew that if I got a peak around nine, it's a one kilohertz signal. If I got a peak around 11 or no, 12 or so, whatever that was, I know that it's a 830 hertz signal. So that's kind of how correlation works, but this is called autocorrelation. What you're doing, you're correlating it with itself. Okay, so now this is enter. We need to talk about continuous versus discrete because remember back here, I talked about, you know, this equation is based on an, you know, this here is based on an F of T, F of a function which is a blackboard equation, right? And that blackboard equation is continuous, right? It's like this, it's a blackboard equation, okay? But what in the real world, we're seeing this, we're seeing discrete points. We're sampling the waveform at various points and we're getting values, we're getting numbers coming in. This is a discrete. So we can't really use the continuous uh, Fourier transform, we have to use the uh, a discrete version of the Fourier transform because we're seeing points and your scope is actually doing it's doing a discrete even though your scope is plotting a nice trace like that it's actually a discrete but it's sampling so fast it's almost as if it's a smooth curve so with a little bit of math you arrive at uh, these equations here so in this example let's assume we've got 46 values you know, and the values are X and N. So X zero is the first one. X one is the second one. X two, you know, X three is the next one and so forth, all the way up to X N, which is 46. In this case, you know, the nth, the last one is 46, right? Or it's zero to 45, right? So the only reason why I'm showing you this so that you understand what N is, because N is gonna become important. So N is just the index of the value we're looking at here. Okay, makes sense. So for example, X zero is zero. X one here will be 13, which would be this point. That's X one. X two will be this number here, which would be 15 and so forth. Okay. So N is, in this case here, this summation, N is the total number of samples. In this case, it's 46. N will become important when we look at the uh, Fourier transform in uh, LT SPICE in a fast Fourier transform. N becomes very important that you understand what N is. But N is the total number of samples that you've captured. So keep that in your back of your mind. In this case, it's 46. Big N is 46. Little N is the index. Little n is the index is telling us which of these values we're dealing with. So we're summing across all the values. So this little x at small n here is actually these values. And we're just doing some math and we're just summing it together. K now is a another special number which you have to know, but you don't have to, have to know it. K is called the bin number. Okay, and it's going to become important, but think of K, uh, this large X, K, large capital X, small K, that becomes your coefficient to say, okay, how much of one megahertz? So X, for example, X1 might be one megahertz, X20 might be 13 megahertz. So XK is just telling you the strength of the frequency for the K bin. And we'll talk about that in a second. Oops, what did I jump ahead? Oops, I jumped ahead way too far ahead here. Okay, so, so this is the discrete Fourier transform. 
It's got cosines and complex numbers and signs and all this stuff. And if you have to do this in a, in a computer, it gets quite hairy and enter in something called the fast Fourier transform. So the fast Fourier, so we talked about a continuous Fourier transform, which is on the black blackboard, right? We talked about discrete Fourier transform, which is the points. And I gave you an example of like the correlation example that uses discrete points. Uh, in my case, I said I used 32 points. If you come back here, I said I used a buffer of 30 samples. So my N was 30, right? CN was 30 here. And uh, so now we're going to enter into the fast Fourier transform. So the fast Fourier transform is an optimized form of the discrete Fourier transform that's used in computers. And it's based on these things called butterflies, and they're just multiplications, and you can see it's in the shape of a, bolt, a butterfly. You've got like the wing here and another wing here, and you see it's all got little butterflies. They're called butterflies. We're not going to talk about butterflies, but that's just the way that the FFT works. It's you use this mechanism to generate your Fourier co coefficients. Now, this is important. Some of the things I'm going to talk here, it's important because if you're going to do an FFT in LT Spice, you have to understand this. Okay. For an FFT to work, that's a fast Fourier transform. For the FFT to work, the samples must be an exp exponent of two. Okay. So it's got to be four, which is two squared, or eight, which is two cubed, or 16, which is two to the fourth right? Or two to the five or two to the six or two to the seventh. It's two to the Y, right? So the number of samples you're going to enter into the Fourier transform must be a exponent of two. If it's not, the fast Fourier transform pukes, okay? Your sample frequency that you're sampling at determines your resolution, most of the time uh, in LT Spice, we don't care about that. In your um, scope, that's taking care of it for you. You don't have to worry about it. In your spectrum analyzer, that's taking care of it for you. But if you're ever going to write your own program for FFT, this becomes important. The sampling frequency determines your resolution. And for example, let's assume we've got, we're sampling at 128 kilohertz then we can only resolve, the maximum frequency we can resolve is 64 kilohertz and that because of this thing called Nyquist. You'll hear people say, oh, that's Nyquist. Well, Nyquist says we can only, uh, the sample frequency, the maximum frequency we can uh, resolve by sampling at a given frequency is half of that fre frequency. So one half of 120 kilohertz is 64 kilohertz. That's the Nyquist uh, frequency. So the bins, remember we talked about K, the bins? The bins are the frequency resolution. So for, in this case, for like N samples, the frequency resolution bin, in this case, is 64 kilohertz divided by 32 to Nyquist. Maximum frequency we resolve divided by the number of samples comes up with two kilohertz. So our bins, each K represents two kilohertz of bandwidth. So K1 would be two kilohertz. K2 will be four kilohertz and so forth. As you go up, you're only able to resolve two kilohertz chunks. That's really important because um, you, um, uh, you can't really resolve like 2.5 kilohertz, or in this case, you can't resolve three kilohertz because you're going up, you're jumping up in steps of two kilohertz. So the interesting to note here, and this becomes important with LT Spice, the more data points you have, the higher your resolution. So in this case, we have 32 samples. If we double that, and we went to 64 samples, then we would resolve to one kilohertz. We can resolve a tighter, our resolution goes up. And if this was a thousand, then our bin size gets really small and we'll be able to, to resolve fractional 
uh, hertz, right? So the maximum, another thing which um, is important, again, the, the, you know, your scope and your spectrum analyzer does all this for you. You'll never see it. But if you're going to be writing your, your own FFT, this is important, is that the maximum frequency we detect is, is half of the bins. So even though we've got 32 samples and our K goes from 0 to 32, we can only resolve half of them because what happens, the FFT wraps around at N divided by 2. And I'll show you an example of, of that in a second. So we can only resolve half of the bins. The other half is just a mirror image of what we would see. So in this case, so bin 4, which is our, our X4, if we go back to, you know, our fast Fourier trend, that's the coefficient X4 is what the fourth bin is seeing. So this is what you would see on your uh, spectrum analyzer or your scope. You would see a peak there. You'd see a peak at X8, you know, at bin 8 or at bin 12 and, and so forth. Okay, so here's an example. I'll just show you this quick, quickly, so you understand what I'm saying about aliasing. Okay, so um, so here, here's an example. So here's the spreadsheet, and I'm doing a fast Fourier transform, and I'm doing it in Excel. And if you get the data analysis add-on for Excel, you could do a fast Fourier transform in Excel. And all I'm doing here is I'm just calculating the sign, based on these numbers here. So that's my frequency. That's the number of samples. So I got 64. That's my N. My sample frequency is 32. My sample rate, my bin, each bin is 0.5 hertz. So if I do, a, do an FFT, here's the FFT here, and here's a uh, here's the signal itself, and here's my FFT. Now, since I'm doing, I'm doing uh, 64, at 32, it wraps around. So this portion is a mirror image of this. So if you count the number of dots here and you count the number of dots here, it's the same. So right here, this is a mirror image of that. And if you go here, you'll see that at bin 12, okay, we've got that value, which is comes out the magnitude is 32. And bin 12, since each bin is 0.5 megahertz, it comes out to 6, 6 hertz or 6 megahertz or whatever you're measuring. And sure enough, that's what we're seeing here. Okay, if we've got four, so here and I've got four functions I've added together and there's that's what it looks like. You know, I do my, my FFT, same thing, 32, it wraps around those four peaks or just a mirror image of that peak, of these four peaks, and you ignore anything after 32. You only look at the small, the uh, lower n by 2 numbers. And again, this is just theoretical. You don't have to worry about this in your scopes or your, or your spectrum analyzer. This is all taken care of uh, for you. But uh, what, what, what's interesting, you can see now, as if I, in my signal, if I put a gap in here, I put a gap in here. Now look at my signal. It gets wider. It's no longer one point. It's now one, two, three points. It gets wider and I get a little bit of noise, a bit of junk at the edges here, right? And that's just because I have a, uh, a uh, I've, uh, zeroed out of, or I've put in a bunch of values here. And this is where you'll see something called windowing. This is where an FFT, you would window. So you'd apply a window to get rid of this. So you'd say, okay, I apply a window on my signal and I only want this section of my signal. And what it does, it gets rid of this nonsense. Same thing if you coming in with zeros at the start or end, same thing. Now, ignore again, after 32, ignore that. That's just a mirror image. Look at here, all of a sudden now, my peak is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven points, huge. And that's because of the zero. And this is where you'd apply a window. You apply a window to get rid of these things at the start and end. Now we're not gonna be talking about windowing here, but uh, window is more so for real time, where you want to just take a signal 
and you've got some junk in, in the signal. Okay, so now finally we get into talking about LT spice. Okay. So how are we doing for time? 817. Okay, so so the way you do a FFT and LT spice, you generate a signal. So in this case, I use this little um, circuit here and I generate a signal called V sine and it's uh, one volt peak at one kilohertz, right? Six signal. And here's a plot here. So you right click on the display window. This window comes up, you hit view and you go over to FFT. So you right click on the display, you click on view, this pops up and you select FFT. Then this window crops up. And this is where now N and your windowing and all this stuff comes into play. Okay, so the first thing you got to do, these are all the voltages. You select what voltage, what plot you want to see, what uh, um, voltage or current. So in this case, we want to see V, uh, V sine, which is this plot here. So we would select V, V sine. That's telling us the number of data points. Now, notice this data points is a uh, exponent of two. So even though it looks pretty large, that's it's two to the 18 is two, six, two, one, four, four. So that is in fact, that's, that's a default it comes out to. Now the number of points here, that's just, it averages. So it takes three points, averages it. So in case you got some noise, it kind of smooths out. And here's your windowing function. Remember in the plot, I showed if you got some, some gnarly stuff, you could window it to get rid of it. In reality, in LT Spice, I can't see you ever using a window function unless you've got some really wonky circuit. But it's more so windowing. I think it's more so for real-time data. But someone may know better than me. So let's let's look at example. So here, so when you do an uh, FFT in LT Spice, this is what you get as a default. Okay. You get this big, huge peak. And remember we saw in my plot that if you've got some zeros or you got some bad data, you got this big, wide peak. So all of a sudden you've got this wide peak across one kilohertz. It's a one kilohertz signal. And then you got all this crap coming out. This should be a pure sine wave. It should only have one point, right? One kilohertz. And if you look, this crap is pretty strong. Now, yes, yeah, 60 dB minus 60 or 70 dB down is, is low. It's not a lot. That's pretty low down. But still, for a pure sine wave, that's that seems a lot. Look at all this crap. So it's like, you know, we've got the cat becomes angry and it's like, what's going on here? So this is resolution number one. This is how you fix that. It comes to N the value of, uh, of N, right? How many sample points? Even though it's taking 262, 144, I don't think it's generating that uh, points, right? So what we need to do is we need to get it to generate more points. So in the case uh, of the um, FFT I did here, I use 10 milliseconds. Now, if I just, I don't do anything, all I do is I increase that to 100 milliseconds. I run the same FFT. All of a sudden, it starts looking better. My point becomes sharper. Look at that. It's no longer this wide peak. It becomes sharper, but I still got a lot of junk. And the other thing, this is going out to like what? 10 megahertz. This is a one kilohertz signal. Do we really need to go out to one megahertz or 10 megahertz? That seems a little bit excessive. So we need to fix that. So the first thing we, you need to, for your um, FFT and LT spice, you got to make sure you're generating a lot of points, a lot of data. So now comes the uh, the this number of points. So even this is not telling you how many points, how much data points it's generating. It's telling it how much data points to use. So the FFT is using all the data points from 100 milliseconds, it's using all those data points, 
but we're saying for our calculation, okay, use, uh, you know, what was it, 2,600, you know, whatever, right? Now, because it's using that many data points, it's taking it out to 10 megahertz. If we were to reduce that to say 4096, okay, all of a sudden now we go to say, uh, what's that, 10 kilohertz, we're going out to 10 kilohertz, right? So we're seeing, we're getting a better um, FFT, still a little bit of noise here, still a little bit of junk, but notice it's dropped down now, 110 dB down. So, so uh, fix number one is to increase the number of points, make the slower time that uh, you're gonna go. So in this case, 100 milliseconds. And the time step, if you go to 50 nanoseconds, it generates even more data points. So you get this nice chart here. And if you go to 4096 here, you reduce the uh, maximum frequency you're gonna see. Okay, so the next thing to clean this stuff up now, to clean this junk up now, in LT Spice, there are some defaults that get set. And these defaults causes us grief. And the first one is this plot win size, which is telling it to compress. So in the background, this is a default setting. It's saying to compress 300 data points. Okay, and when it's doing that, you use, you're losing resolution. So one of the things you have to do is disable this compression by setting plot wind size to zero. The next thing is that the default for the number of digits, number of decimal points, right? Number of digits it's gonna use is six, which is a single precision floating point. We want double precision. So we want to increase the number of, of uh, um, at digits and it says here if it's greater than six it becomes double precision so i used eight and so if i do i add those two spice directives i run my uh, transient analysis 100 megahertz 50 nanosecond timestamps and i do my fft look at this sweet flat known garbage one nice peak which is what i would expect we have a happy cat. Okay, so now you guys are gonna hate me because I, I talked about all this Fourier stuff and correlation and all this stuff. And in LT Spice, there's a fast and easy way of doing this. And you guys are gonna probably, next time you see me, you're gonna drop kick me and go, why did you go through all this crap with me? Because it's it builds character. So in LT Spice, there's a Spice directive called dot four, dot Fourier. So the way it works is you enter a Spice directive called dot four, the frequency of interest you want, say one megahertz. In this case, the case we've been looking at is one, sorry, one kilohertz, right? Yeah. The number of harmonics we want to analyze. So it could be one harmonic, five, 10, 100. How many harmonics you want to um, uh, analyze, and the number. This is the number of periods, the number of data, so number of cycles, so the number of data. I usually use the minus one, which means all. If you use minus one here, it means all. Okay, and I think if you use, uh, if you leave it blank, it also means uh, all too. And then the data trace is the actual, uh, the trace that you want to to show. So in our case, it was V, uh, V sign, the voltage of V sign, right? So if you enter this um, spice directive uh, here, right up here, you enter it there and you run it, you'd end up with something that looks like this. It gives you the DC component, which is that, remember that A naught term, right? It tells you if it's got a DC component and then it tells you the frequencies so here's a harmonics. In this case, I said 1,000 hertz, four harmonics, all data points, and look at V, V sine. Okay, so there's my four harmonics, which is one kilohertz, two kilohertz, three kilohertz, four kilohertz. 
and then it's telling me the strength of the one kilohertz signal, two kilohertz, three kilohertz, four kilohertz. So these will be like your peaks. That'll be giving you the peaks in your FFT plot. Then this here is really cool. It's giving you the normalized component. So it's taking the fundamental and it's dividing all the values by the fundamental. So the cool thing here is because it's done this, you could get now the dB, how far, uh, how far down it's, it's in dB. So in this case, if you take this number, 4.99 times 10 to the minus 7, you take the log of that, again, log 10, not log E. You take the, the log base 10 of that, right? And you multiply it by 20 because we're dealing with voltages here, not power. You would get how far it's this signal down from the fundamental, which is pretty cool. Now, the cool other thing here, it's telling us the total harmonic distortion. So what is that? So the total harmonic distortion, it's telling us, it's giving us a measure of how much harmonics we've got. So it's used mainly used in, in, in audio to tell us how much harmonic distortion we have in, in, uh, in uh, audio. Now, what the way it works out is you've got this equation here, and it's the root mean square value, root square root of the sum of the squares, square root, root mean uh, sum, right? So basically what it means, if you take this, this is your uh, Fourier spectrum. This is your, you know, from your spectrum analyzer or from LT Spice or from your scope or, or whatever. You've got the fundamental, okay? And your fun fundamental's got strength, you know, that's, that's the magnitude. Here's the next harmonic, here's the next harmonic, so forth. So if you take the square root of the strengths of all these harmonics, you sum them and you divide by this harmonic, the strength of this, the fundamental, right? That gives you the, the total harmonic distortion. So that's, uh, that's an important parameter for me when I'm measuring uh, my amplifiers because I don't have to go through and do these stupid FFTs and be measuring the, uh, um, the peaks. I could just use this dot four command. And so, you know, um, remember we said that, uh, you know, it's, you know, this in, in Canada, we need to be for 10 watts, we need to be 44 dB down from the fundamental. I'm just using DBC, right? Uh, DBC's carrier again, but it's uh, fundamental. Um, so I, you know, we assume 44. So if you look at with a little bit of math, you solve this, you'll find uh, the strongest harmonic has to be 0.63% of the fundamental. So let's do a little experiment here. Let's have an LT spy circuit. We've got our fundamental, which is one kilohertz, magnitude one, strength one, one volt. And here we've got a second signal, which is three kilohertz, which is the, what's that? The uh, first, like third harmonic. It's the third harmonic, right? And we set the voltage of that to uh, 6.3 millivolts or 0 .00, 0 0.0063 volts, right? 6.3 millivolts comes out to 0 .063, 0 0.0063, right? So if we do that and we plot it, this is what we get in a little bit of math here, you know, 20 log 0 0.0063 divided by one is just basically 20 divided by 6.3 millivolts, which comes out minus 44, which is what we wanted here. So, you know, the math works out. So if we were to do the, use the dot four spice directive um, in LT spice for that little circuit we've got here, right? We add the dot four. And uh, as I said, where I had it, uh, yeah, dot four, 1004 minus one, we, Add that directive there, okay, and uh, this is what we would arrive at. Our fundamental 
that's the strength of it. The second harmonic, the third harmonic, and so forth. And if you look at the strength of it, look at the third harmonic. It comes out exactly 6.3 times 10 to the minus 3. So if we take log of that times by 20, it comes out to 44. Right? And look at this. Look at the total harmonic distortion. It's coming out to 0 0.062%, 0 0.063%, which is what we need. So I could use this now and I can figure out whether I could figure out the spectral purity. I don't need to go and go and do all that rigmarole with uh, LT Spice. So last slide. So let me put this in a nutshell for you. Okay. So use the, the Fourier transform to uh, decompose a continuous signal. That's the blackboard, right? You use the discrete Fourier transform to decompose a sample waveform to get the frequency components. And that's what your spectrum analyzer does, right? And uh, use the fast Fourier transform to optimize the discrete Fourier, uh, discrete Fourier transform to do it faster and with less math. So typically you may get that in your scope, although your scope may have a, an FPGA in it, I don't know, but certainly a microcontroller is gonna be doing an FFT and an LT Spice, it's doing a FFT. There's some rules when you're using an FFT. Uh, key one is it's gotta be an ex exponent of two. If you go into LT Spice and where was a little signal here and you went in here and you put in a number other than a power of two, your LT spice would puke. LT spice would puke and would come back with, with an error. Okay, your sample frequency is important, bin size, all that stuff, right? By default, LT spice does a crappy job of doing an FFT. You got to disable compression, you got to change the decimal precision, you got to increase the number of data points, i.e., longer simulation time and faster computation interval and you reduce the number of data points in the FFT to match the total bandwidth. You're not reducing the number of data points to use in your calculation using the number of data points, the number of bins, right, to reduce the, uh, uh, the overall bandwidth. Okay, and uh, it's far easier to use the dot four directive, which gives you the strength of your harmonics, provides you the DC level, and the nice thing it provides you the the total harmonic distortion, which is really important. So at that point, I'll end this. And the next presentation, we'll talk about doing uh, measurements in LT Spice.